So many people are using PE ratios wrong and it's totally destroying their portfolios. So I analyzed the US's 100 largest companies to show you how to use it correctly. Because you can use the PE ratio to find great investments, it's just that most people are asking the completely wrong question when using this indicator. The general point of the PE ratio is that it measures the price a company is trading at versus how much net income that company is making. So a low PE ratio means the company is making a lot of profit it compared to its price and people take that as a good indication that it's undervalued and sure that might work sometimes but most of the time a low price to earnings is a terrible indicator of an undervalued stock. So I've analysed the share price growth of 100 stocks from five years ago to today to see which metrics actually indicated a good investment and the results are extremely useful. I hold data for thousands of stocks which I collected back in 2019 so for this analysis I selected just the 100 largest US stocks I hold in my data set from June 2019 and compared the market cap or total value of the company to what it is today which gives us the total growth of each company. We can then use this to see if there was any correlation between the PE ratio in 2019 and the company's share price growth over the following five years to today. But before we do that, let me very quickly explain how this is actually going to work and exactly what we're looking out for. For each company, I calculated the percentage change in market cap between June 2019 and today. I then calculated the correlation between that growth and the 2019 PE ratio. Ultimately, that's going to tell us whether stocks with a low PE ratio went on to experience higher or lower share price growth or if it just had no influence at all. Now calculating a correlation gives you a number between 1 and a minus 1 which essentially measures the strength of the relationship between the two things. This number is called the correlation coefficient. The further away from zero the number is, the stronger the relationship. Typically, anything above 0.3 or below minus 0.3 would indicate some kind of relationship. So if there were a strong relationship between low PE ratios and then a high growth rate in the value of the company for those following five years, you might expect a correlation coefficient of something like minus 0.4, which would basically mean companies with lower PE ratios tend to see their share price grow. Okay, mass that's an over. This is what happened when I calculated the correlation of PE ratio to growth for those 100 companies. I got a correlation coefficient of 0.044, which is so close to zero, it means there was absolutely no relationship between the PE ratio of the US's top 100 stocks in 2019 and their following five-year share price growth none at all. And whilst that's interesting, it's what I did next that's really important for you to know about, because it turns out there is a metric which does correlate with share price growth. And to find it, I calculated the correlation between the company's growth since 2019 and 14 other financial metrics to see if any of them could have been used to identify the stocks with the most growth potential. Here's the full list, ordered with the strongest correlations at the top and the weakest at the bottom. And the metric with the strongest correlation to share price growth was cash to debt with a coefficient of 0.38 which is super interesting because this metric kind of indicates a number of things. First of all a company with high cash to debt is more protected from economic shocks like interest rate hikes. It also has more cash on hand to reinvest back into growth and take advantage of opportunities when they arise like acquisitions. And it's also an indicator although not a guarantee that the company has been well managed and profitable in the past allowing it to build up its cash reserves. And if we go to the next metric on the list, we get another interesting entry, the revenue growth for the previous five years, aka 2014 to 2019. In fact, if we look at all the metrics, we can see the traditional value ratios, the PE and PB ratios, are right near the bottom of the list. Neither one of them indicated at all whether the shares would rise over the next five years. But there is more to this story, because as we delve deeper into the data, we discover the PE ratio can actually still help us make good investment decisions. We just have to use it the right way. Let me show you. This is the split of those 100 stocks and I've labelled the worst performing half in terms of share price growth as the underperform category and the best performing half are in the outperform category. Our aim is to use a simple, sensible technique to find as many outperforming stocks as possible using the metrics from 2019. We know the five-year revenue growth was one of the best indicators of future share price growth. So I've tried a little experiment to see if combining the PE ratio and the five-year revenue growth 
could help us find the best investments. I selected only those stocks which had a PE ratio less than 35 and a five-year revenue growth above 20%. In theory, these should be reasonably priced stocks with a history of business growth. The result is a list of 31 stocks in which 23 outperformed the average and only eight underperformed, with an average growth between 2019 and now of 214%. Pretty darn impressive. But to make this a fair test, I needed to check whether choosing a PE ratio below 35 was actually making any difference or if it was just the high revenue growth. So I changed the selection to stocks with a price to earnings above 35 and kept the minimum five year revenue required at above 20% and the difference was huge. This time 22 stocks matched the criteria but only 12 of them outperformed, the other 10 underperformed and the overall average share price growth was just 99%. That's compared to the 214% of the first test. So in this instance it's pretty clear that using the PE ratio in conjunction with another indicator can help us find some good investments. But how can we apply this logic to investments now? Because what was true five years ago isn't necessarily true now. For example, the average PE ratio for those 100 companies back in 2019 was 36.6. Today, the average PE ratio for the same 100 companies is 44.3. And there's more complication because PE ratios tend to vary quite significantly by sector. Here's a list of sectors and the current average PE ratio for each one, made up from the top 100 US companies. It's probably worth taking a screenshot of this because it's useful information to have. You might notice the healthcare sector is a bit of an outlier here. It does have a giant average PE ratio of 116, but this is actually mostly caused by a single company, which has a gargantuan PE ratio of 1,074, dragging the average up significantly. And without them included, it comes down into the 40s. But even if we ignore healthcare, you'll still see a huge gap between the sectors, with tech stocks at 70p and energy stocks all the way down at 15. This is vital information to know because a PE ratio at say 30 doesn't mean a stock is over or undervalued, it's entirely the context that's important. And let me show you how we can apply that to find interesting stocks today. What the data so far has told us is that stocks with a medium or lower PE ratio and crucially a strong history of growth and abundant cash resources have great potential for share price growth. And for a second, let's cut out all the fancy technical terms and speak about what this is actually telling us. The data is telling us not to look for undervalued stocks, but instead it's telling us to find great businesses in growing industries with strong underlying financials, which are reasonably priced. That is what people get wrong about using the PE ratio. A lot of new investors use it as the first indicator of finding a good investment, when actually they should be using it as one of the last. The most important thing to find is a good business first then assess the value. Let me jump over to our website, investor52.com, and show you an example of two great businesses today, whose PE ratios really aren't that high, and you've definitely heard of both of them. Alphabet is, of course, Google's parent company, and it's one of the largest and most well-known businesses in the world, and if we take a look at its metrics, you'll see that status is very well-deserved. To explain what we're looking at here, these metrics are automatically color-coded with green, indicating that Google is amongst the best in its sector for that metric, and red indicating it's one of the worst with the metrics split into categories of value financial strength and growth immediately we can see google massively outperforms in the strength and growth metrics offering extremely low levels of debt huge amounts of cash flow and very solid growth figures. They're impressive numbers by anyone's standard and indicate Google has a terrific history of growth and currently generates huge sums of cash, which we know is a great indicator of future share price growth. Now, if we jump over to the value metrics, we'll see it's trading at what is actually a pretty reasonable 23.8 PE ratio and an even more attractive PEG ratio, which is the metric that analyzes the price to earnings along with the expected growth of the company, in which we can see Google actually sits in the bottom 40% for its sector. So Google looks extremely well placed for future share price growth. Now for full transparency, I'm not invested in Google because I have big questions about how search engines will be impacted by the rise of AI. 
we're already seeing a stark difference in searches related to computer programming and coding. And since a huge chunk of Google's revenue comes from advertisements in the search engine, I don't feel comfortable investing, purely because I think there are other more certain industries out there. Having said that, Google has all of the resources required to diversify their income if necessary. So I would be very surprised if they didn't experience solid share price growth over the next 10 years. But one company I am invested in is Meta. So let's take a look at them. Meta, previously Facebook, has, in my opinion, been one of the best run companies over the last decade. They are a cash generating machine, which is clear when you look at their metrics. Their free cash flow is gigantic, as are their growth figures. And whilst my only reservation about Google is that search engines might soon be a thing of the past, I think all the diversification efforts currently being led by Mark Zuckerberg are absolutely the things of the future, and I'm very excited by them. But what's interesting about Meta as an investment is that even though it's involved in some of the most exciting and cutting edge tech in the world, has an incredible growth rate and generates a huge amount of cash, its share price value rarely reflects that. In fact, it's about the highest it's been now for a long time, but it still trades at a relatively modest 27.8 PE. And if you want to discover more great stocks just like this, Investor52.com was specifically built for beginner and early investors. You can easily search for stocks that meet the criteria of legendary investment strategies and quickly analyze the key metrics of America's 500 largest companies against their sector competitors. It's the easiest way to find great stocks in seconds.